Conspiracy theories are nothing new. They've been circulating for years. Now, some are just plain ridiculous, while others sound quite plausible, although have no solid evidence to back them up. But then there are conspiracies that turn out to be true. Well, here we have a mix of some conspiracy theories that turned out to be true, and others that have been debunked. As always, sit back and enjoy. Tobacco companies knew cigarettes caused cancer years before they did anything and tried to convince the public the claims were just a conspiracy theory. Nowadays, we should all know that smoking is deadly and that cigarette smoke either inhaled by the smoker or passively by a non-smoker is responsible for 7 million deaths per year worldwide. And for every person that dies because of smoking, at least 30 others live with a serious smoking related illness. Now it's not just lung cancer, smoking harms nearly every organ in the body and is still the leading cause of preventable deaths in the world. So why, after knowing all this, is smoking still legal? And why do people still smoke? Well, we have to go back a long way. Tobacco has been growing wild for thousands of years and originally was chewed or smoked in a pipe, usually during cultural or religious ceremonies. In 1531, tobacco was cultivated for the first time in Europe and soon spread across the rest of the world. By the 1700s, a tobacco industry had developed, and by the 1800s, the ability to mass produce cigarettes massively expanded the scope for consumption. Around the same time, people started dying of lung cancer, although at first, tobacco was not even suspected. In the early 1800s, lung cancer was still a very rare disease, so rare in fact, that medical professors when confronted with the case, sometimes told their students to take note, as they might never see it again. However, in 1898, a German medical student by the name of Hermann Rottenmann proposed that tobacco dust might be causing the increased incidence of lung tumours, particularly amongst German tobacco workers. Of course he was wrong, and his mistake was not corrected until 1912, when it was proposed that smoking the tobacco might be to blame, not just the dust. By the 1920s, surgeons were encountering cases with increasing frequency, and although smoking was sometimes blamed, other things such as asphalt dust from newly tarred roads, industrial air pollution, and latent effects from exposure to poison gas in the First World War were also thought to be responsible. Some even believed the fallout from the global influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1919 was responsible. These, and a number of other theories were put forward as possible explanations for the rise in lung cancer, until evidence from multiple sources made it clear that tobacco was almost certainly the leading cause. So, nearly a hundred years ago, it was known that smoking tobacco would kill you. As the century progressed, so did the mass production of cigarettes, along with incidents of lung cancer. Then in the 1940s and 50s, Epidemiological studies confirmed that smokers of cigarettes were far more likely to contract lung cancer than non-smokers. As you would expect, cigarette manufacturers disputed this evidence, although it is now known that researchers in the tobacco industry were also convinced of a cigarette cancer link, and they clearly knew their product was dangerous, even discussing producing a cancer-free cigarette. Nevertheless, public confidence in tobacco was shaken and stock prices of American cigarette manufacturers plummeted. Tobacco manufacturers saw this new health scare as a mortal threat to their livelihood, so decided to organize a response. On December 14, 1953, CEOs of the six largest tobacco manufacturers in the USA met to plan a response. The outcome was an extensive plan to discredit the accumulating evidence. So by using adverts, press releases, and corporate smoothing with popular science writers and journalists, they set out to reassure the public. The campaign was a success, and consumption rebounded from its 1953 decline, and continued to grow throughout the 1960s, 70s, and early 80s. It seems that despite overwhelming evidence that smoking could kill, it was largely rejected by the public as a scaremongering conspiracy theory. After all, surely they would not be legal for sale if they were a danger to life. In fact, such was the dismissal of the theory that by the 1960s, cigarette smoking was at an all-time high. 
and alarmingly, two-thirds of US doctors believed that smoking caused no health issues. With that endorsement, it was no surprise that most people remained unconvinced that smoking caused any life-threatening health issues. No one can say how many lives were lost as a result of this move by the tobacco industry to squash the scientific evidence and dismiss as a conspiracy the harm their product was doing, but it's likely in the millions. The tragedy is magnified by the fact that the overwhelming majority of these deaths, around 95%, are entirely preventable. Lung cancer today is primarily caused by the inhalation of smoke from cigarettes. The cigarette is the most lethal artifact in the history of human civilization, and although consumption rates are falling in most of the richer countries, smoking rates remain high, or even increasing in many parts of the world, particularly in China, where about 2.4 trillion cigarettes are manufactured each year. In the 20th century, it was estimated 100 million people died from smoking-related illnesses. That is predicted to increase in the 21st century. The government poisoned alcohol during Prohibition, kind of. Prohibition in the United States was a nationwide constitutional ban on the production, importation, transportation and sale of alcoholic beverages from 1920 to 1933. Prohibition was intended to deter the consumption of alcohol, which was seen as unhealthy and a public nuisance. Not only would that prove almost impossible to achieve, but the government's determination to block the misuse of industrial alcohol led to the unintentional but disastrous poisoning, paralysis and deaths of thousands of drinkers at the hands of bootleggers. The Prohibition Act contained two notable exceptions to its ban, alcohol dispensed by doctors as prescription medicine and liquors produced and used for religious ceremonies. Although it's worth pointing out that there was no medical evidence that alcohol gave any benefits as a tonic or stimulant for healing. However, because it was permitted during prohibition, it proved very lucrative for both doctors and druggists, and an excuse for patients to obtain booze, and the popularity of medicinal alcohol sent profits through the roof. But for those that couldn't obtain alcohol legitimately, they turned to the bootlegging booze, with disastrous consequences. Years before prohibition, industrial grade undrinkable alcohol was used in factories as a solvent and cleaning fluid and to manufacture detergent and other products. At the time, all alcohol was subject to excise taxes. However, in 1906, a bill was passed that made industrial alcohol tax-free as long as substances were added to it to make it undrinkable. This was known as denatured alcohol. Despite the additives making the alcohol foul-tasting and dangerous to drink, it didn't deter bootleggers who started redistilling denatured industrial alcohol and selling it disguised as whiskey, often making the consumers unwell or even killing them. By 1923, the Treasury Department's Prohibition Bureau tried to prevent organized crime from reconditioning industrial alcohol for sale to drinkers and instructed makers of the industrial used liquid to add more additives to make it harder for bootleggers to remove the foul taste and smell. A deadly concoction was then created, included amongst other things, ether, chloroform, carbolic acid acetone, and perhaps the most deadly ingredient, methyl or wood alcohol. But undeterred bootleggers still stole large quantities of the liquid, knowing full well it contained poison, and attempted to remove the toxins by boiling the grain and wood alcohol mixture in illegal stills. But they couldn't boil it to the heat needed to remove the toxins, meaning a small amount of wood alcohol remained. When this was ingested, it attacked the nervous system, often causing blindness and even death. In New York alone in 1926, about 750 perished after guzzling the wood alcohol-laced bootlegger liquor. The same happened in other states, and it was estimated that up to 50,000 people may have died from the repurposed industrial alcohol nationwide. And thousands of others were stricken by crippling paralysis. Critics, including anti-prohibitionists, blame the deaths and injuries on reckless government policies, such as the absence of warning labels on containers of industrial alcohol, and accuse the US government of legalized murder. The government acted by passing a new law lowering the maximum wood alcohol content in industrial alcohol to 2%. 
and the head chemist for the Prohibition Bureau worked on perfecting a new, less harmful, but still foul-smelling and tasting denaturant, such as kerosene. The feds later approved the addition of ingredients such as iodine, ether, nicotine, and formaldehyde to try to make industrial alcohol too horrible to drink. By the 1930s, the earnings of America's bootleggers hit an estimated $3 billion, although by then, criminal distributors had shifted from industrial alcohol to distilling their own raw alcohol with sugar, yeast, and other ingredients, producing booze good enough and safe enough to drink. So although the popular belief is that the government deliberately poisoned industrial alcohol during Prohibition, the truth is they had been adding poison to industrial alcohol for years before Prohibition because it wasn't designed to be drunk in the first place. Obviously, adding additional poison during Prohibition was a disastrous decision. Project Sunshine and the Conspiracy about how bodies were obtained on August 6th and 9th, 1945, the United States detonated two nuclear weapons over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The two bombings killed between 129,000 and 226,000 people, most of whom were civilians, and caused devastating health and environmental damage for years to come. The incident was the first and last time nuclear weapons were used in armed conflict. In the wake of the bombing, the US government commenced a major study into the effects of nuclear fallout on the human body. The research started in 1953, but was kept secret until 1956. The investigation was called Project Sunshine. After the public became aware of the project, theories started circulating that to carry out their research, the government was stealing dead bodies. However, as bad as that seemed, the truth was even worse than the conspiracy theory. Project Sunshine sought to measure the global dispersion of strontium-90, a major radioactive product of nuclear fission caused by the explosions. To do this, they chose to measure its concentration in the tissues and bones of the dead. Of particular interest to them was tissue from the young, whose developed bones have the highest capacity to accumulate SR-90, and thus the highest susceptibility to radiation damage. After details of Project Sunshine were made public in 1956, theories started circulating about how the bodies were obtained. However, it was many years before the truth was revealed, when in 1995, former President Clinton released classified documents from the Atomic Energy Commission, which showed that scientists working on Project Sunshine were fully aware of the dubious ethical and legal grounds on which their research was being conducted. In a transcript of a secret meeting on January 18, 1955, Dr. Willard Libby, who headed up the Sunshine Project, acknowledged that the difficulty in getting human samples was resulting in great gaps in the project's findings. And he's quoted as saying, I don't know how to get them, but I do say that it's a matter of prime importance to get them, and particularly in the young age group. So human samples are of prime importance, and if anyone knows how to do a good job of body snatching, they will really be serving their country. As a result of his plea, a worldwide network of agents were recruited to find recently deceased babies and children, to take samples and even limbs, all obtained without notification or permission of their grieving families. Over 1,500 samples were gathered, of which only 500 were analysed. Many of the 1,500 sample cadavers were babies and young children, and were taken from countries from Australia to Europe. After a documentary about the scandal was released in 1995, a British mother revealed that in 1957, her stillborn baby's legs were removed by British doctors for the project. And to prevent her from finding out what had happened, she was not allowed to dress the baby in a christening robe for the funeral. This was just one horrific example of what happened during Project Sunshine. And for many of the unsuspecting parents, they may never know what happened to parts of their children's dead bodies. Incredibly, despite several reports in the media, there has been no official investigations into the murky experiments of Project Sunshine. The Roswell Conspiracy On June 14, 1947, 
Mac Brazel and his son Vermin were driving across their ranch located 80 miles northwest of Roswell, New Mexico, when they came across some debris. Mac described it as a large area of bright wreckage made up of rubber strips, tin foil, and rather tough paper and sticks. The metallic looking fine fabric was shredded and scattered across the gravel and sagebrush of the New Mexico desert. Mac had no idea what he'd stumbled upon. After several days, he decided to gather up all of the mysterious wreckage and put it in his truck, and on July 7th, he drove it to Roswell and handed it over to Sheriff George Wilcox. Wilcox was also puzzled and decided to contact Colonel Butch Blanchard, commander of the Roswell Army Airfield's 509th Composite Group located just outside of town. Blanchard was equally perplexed, and after consulting a few other colleagues, he eventually contacted his superior, General Roger W. Ramey, commander of the 8th Air Force in Fort Worth, Texas. Blanchard also sent Major Jesse Marcel, an intelligence officer from the base, to investigate more thoroughly. Guided by the sheriff and Mac, Marcel returned to the site and collected all of the remaining wreckage. But in a strange move, the RAAF chose to make a public statement on the find. The comments featured in the local afternoon newspaper, the Roswell Daily Record, along the headline, RAAF captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell. The report also contained this memorable sentence. The intelligence office of the 509th Bombardment Group at Roswell Army Airfield announced at noon today that the field has come into the possession of a flying saucer. But US Army officials quickly reversed themselves on the flying saucer claim, stating that the found debris was actually from a weather balloon, releasing photographs of Major Marshall posing with pieces of the supposed weather balloon debris as proof. And so the famous Roswell incident was born. Over the years, some extraordinary claims have been put forward about alien beings captured and experimented on, and claims of cover-ups and UFOs, something we have covered in detail in previous videos. However, in recent years, it's come to light that it may have been possible that from the Air Force's perspective, it was better to announce that there was a crashed alien spacecraft rather than tell the truth. And what had actually had crashed on that ranch in Roswell was a high altitude balloon that was being used as part of a top secret project by the US Army Air Forces known as Project Mogul, a project that involved microphones flown on high altitude balloons whose primary purpose was long distance detection of sound waves generated by Soviet atomic bomb tests. All part of several espionage programs involving overflights and photographic surveillance of the Soviet Union at the time. The project was moderately successful and ran between 1947 until early 1949, but it was very expensive and was superseded by a network of seismic detectors and air sampling for fallout, which were cheaper, more reliable, and easier to deploy and operate. The project required several balloons carrying disc microphones and radio transmitters to relay the signal to the ground. The balloon had to maintain a relatively consistent altitude over a prolonged period of time. The initial mogul balloons consisted of large clusters of rubber meteorological balloons. However, these were soon replaced by huge balloons made of polyethylene plastic. These were better at maintaining a constant altitude than the early rubber ones. Unlike a weather balloon, the Project Mogul equipment was massive and contained unique types of material. To the untrained eye, the radar reflectors and other metallic parts of the structure when deflated, could easily be mistaken for a flying saucer, or so we're told. So is this the official explanation for the Roswell incident? Of course, there is a counter-conspiracy theory to all of this. That is, that Project Mogul was a cover-up for the fact a UFO did crash at Roswell in 1947. What do you think? trying to debunk the latest declassified UFO video. Now this one is hot off the press, and speaking of UFOs, we couldn't not talk about this one. It's not exactly a conspiracy theory, but rather a group of people who are trying to debunk one of the most important announcements ever for the UFO community. An announcement that we have extensively covered on this channel and will continue to do so. 
It seems that despite the Pentagon admitting that they have no idea what the objects in the videos are, some are still insisting what is being seen as birds, balloons, or other Earth-related material. After such a dramatic turn of events by the Pentagon, it seems incredible now that some are trying to debunk the clear evidence of a UFO. So let's look at the claims by science writer and professional debunker Mick West. West claims what is being seen in this video is likely a distant plane. He maintains after studying the object, it doesn't actually move on the screen except when the camera moves, and it resembles an out of focus, low resolution, backlit plane. As for the gimbal video, again West believes this is a plane. He claims it's not rotating, and what you are seeing is the infrared glare of the engines that look larger than the plane. It looks like it's rotating because of a peculiarity of the gimbal mounted camera system. He explained the so called aura around the plane is just image sharpening, something that happens all the time in thermal camera footage. As for the go fast video, Wes believes what is being seen here is either a balloon or a bird. He claims it is not moving fast, it's not skimming the water, it's just an effect caused by parallax. Of course, those who are passionate about proving the existence of extraterrestrial life, like ourselves, are concerned that claims like this dampen the significance of the declassified videos. The explanations also presuppose that decorated military pilots like Commander Fravor could mistake a 40 plus foot craft that neutralized weapon systems with active jamming for a bird or balloon. The theories rely solely on what can be seen in the video and discounts all other elements, most importantly the pilot's own first hand accounts. We won't go through all of these three videos, as we've already done that in detail before, we'll just look at some of the facts known about the go fast video, that more than discount the bird or balloon theory. The average temperature of the surface of the ocean at the time the go fast video was captured was about 62.6 .6 degrees Fahrenheit, or 17 degrees Celsius. The GoFast UFO was colder than 62.6 .6 degrees, as indicated by the FLIR targeting pod data. The average temperature of a bird, for instance, is 105 Fahrenheit, or 40 degrees Celsius. It's a fact that almost every bird becomes hypothermic at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, causing them skeletal muscular paralysis, meaning it would be impossible to perform at top speed or navigate at level with the ocean. Furthermore, it's colder than any known propulsion systems. Propulsion systems tend to generate lots of heat. The Go Fast UFO is moving very fast. The fastest bird on Earth is the Peregrine Falcon with recorded dive bombs of up to 240 miles per hour. That has the ability to elevate and plummet down, but at that speed it can't fly parallel to the ocean's surface, which is what we clearly see in the Go Fast UFO video. The speed also discounts the balloon theory, as there is no way an inflated or deflated balloon could travel at such speeds. If you listen to the audio of the pilots, they were blown away by the speed of the object. They know it was not a bird or anything they had ever seen before. The object also appears to be flying under intelligent control and technology beyond what's known to the US or other arsenals. So do we think these videos show birds, planes or balloons? We do not. These things were different to any known craft, and to suggest anything otherwise seems ludicrous, especially when experienced Navy pilots had no idea what they were witnessing. Now we very often give our own personal opinions on this channel, but the claims are a bizarre example of circulating a conspiracy while trying to debunk known facts about something that is clearly unexplained, and is groundbreaking for the UFO community. It's taken years for the Pentagon to finally admit that there are things out there that they cannot explain. Whether they are extraterrestrial in nature, no one knows, and cannot say so. But as they are unexplained, it opens up that possibility and keeps the belief alive that we are not alone in the universe. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.